Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Just Kids by Patti Smith. So, I've kind of been doing this more in my recent videos where I've been reviewing books as I go along. I think that works especially well with stuff like this where it's non-fiction because I'm kind of living the life through the story, you know? So I'm going to read you this little tiny blurb here. Just Kids begins as a love story and ends as an elegy. It serves as a salute to New York City during the late 60s and 70s and to its rich and poor, its hustlers and hellions. A true fable, it is a portrait of two young artists ascent, a prelude to fame. And so yeah, Patti Smith is like a musician and I guess an artist as well. And this tells the story of her and uh, Robert Mapplethorpe, I think he's called. This is my ignorance here because I don't really know who he is, but I know who she is, if that makes sense. But yeah, it's a really well-written memoir, so I'm going to take a few bits that kind of stood out to me here. So here she's talking about her friend called Janet Hamill, but I just thought the musical context here was, was, quite, was quite cool as well. My compatriot from college, Janet Hamill, bolstered my morale. She had lost her mother and came to stay with my family. I shared my little quarters with her. Both of us harboured lofty dreams, but also a common love of rock and roll, spending long evenings discoursing on the Beatles versus the Rolling Stones. We had stood in line for hours at Sam Goody's to purchase Blonde on Blonde, combing Philadelphia in search of a scarf like the one Bob Dylan wore on the cover. We lit candles for him when he had his motorcycle accident. We lay in the high grass listening to Light My Fire wafting from the radio of Janet's battered car parked by the side of the road with the doors open. We cut our long skirts to the mini lengths of Vanessa Redgraves in Blow Up and searched for great coats in thrift stores like those worn by Oscar Wilde and Baudelaire. So I think this is interesting as well. She sort of got really into Rimbo and um, obviously he writes in French <laughs> and we get this Rimbo held the keys to a mystical language that I devoured even as I could not fully decipher it my unrequited love for him was as real to me as anything I had experienced at the factory where I had laboured with a hard-edged illiterate group of women I was harassed in his name suspecting me of being a communist for reading a book in a foreign language they threatened me in the john prodding me to denounce him and um, yeah, early in her life, she actually had a child and then gave it away for adoption. And she was treated really badly in the hospital. So the nurses were like calling her a hippie and threatening to cut her hair and stuff. But uh, eventually she gets to New York and she meets Robert. And um, what was this bit I was going to read here? Uh, oh, yeah. So this kind of gives you a, 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 a kind of an insight into the way they lived, I suppose. So she says, after work, I would meet him downtown and we would walk through the yellow filtered light of the East Village, past the Fillmore East and the Electric Circus, the places we had passed on our first walk together. It was, it was exciting just to stand in front of the hollowed ground of Birdland that had been blessed by John Coltrane, or the five spot on St. Mark's Place where Billie Holiday used to sing, where Eric Dolphy and Ornette Coleman opened the field of jazz like human can openers. We couldn't afford to go inside. On other days, we would visit art museums. There was only enough money for one ticket, so one of us would go in, look at the exhibits, and report back to the other. But they made it work, you know? We have a reference here to her, uh, her singing So You Want To Be A Rock and Roll Star, which I play with my friend Dave sometimes. Oh, and she worked at Scribner's for a while as well, so it says here. I was promoted at Scribner's from the phone desk to sales. That year, the big sellers were Adam Smith's The Money Game and Tom Wolfe's Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test, summing up the polarisation of everything that was rampant in our country. I identified with neither. I felt disconnected from all that was outside the world that Robert and I had created between us. And, um, yeah, it's cool, because I have the Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test on my TBR, which I will get to it soon, I promise. There are so many books! There are so many books! Alright, i got a couple more things I would like to flag up for you lot, you lovely lot. I thought this was another little interesting bit that helps you to give some context of what, what, when all this was happening. The moon was on the cover of Life magazine, but the headlines of every newspaper were emblazoned with the brutal murders of Sharon Tate and her companions, because of the moon landing. The Manson murders didn't gel with any film noir vision I had of crime, but it was the kind of news that sparked the imagination of the hotel inhabitants. Nearly everyone was obsessed with Charles Manson. At first, Robert went over every detail with Harry and Peggy, but I couldn't bear talking about it. The last moments of Sharon Tate haunted me, imagining her horror knowing that they were about to slaughter her unborn child. I retreated into my poems, scrawling in an orange composition book. Envisioning Brian Jones floating face down in a swimming pool was as much tragedy as I could handle. See, this is the kind of thing that makes you realise just how mad her life was as well. So she's gone to the automat, right? Which I think is some laundry, I don't know. Maybe it's an ATM. Anyway. I got my tray and slipped in my coins, but the window wouldn't open. I tried again without luck, and then I noticed the price had gone up to 65 cents. I was disappointed, to say the least, when I heard a voice say, Can I help? I turned around, and it was Allen Ginsberg. We had never met, but there was no mistaking the face of one of our great poets and activists. 
I looked into those intense dark eyes punctuated by his dark curly beard and just nodded. Alan added the extra dime and also stood me to a cup of coffee. I wordlessly followed him to his table and then ploughed into the sandwich. Alan introduced himself. He was talking about Walt Whitman and I mentioned I was raised near Camden where Whitman was buried when he leaned forward and looked at me intently. Are you a girl? he asked. Yeah, I said. Is that a problem? He just laughed. I'm sorry, I took you for a very pretty boy. I got the picture immediately. Well, does this mean I return the sandwich? No, enjoy it. It was my mistake. So here we go, we have another moment where this happens, where she just casually bumps into someone. Viva stormed into the lobby with a Garbo-like inapproachability, attempting to intimidate Mr. Bard so he wouldn't ask her for back rent. The filmmaker Shirley Clark and the photographer Diane Arbus entered separately, each with a sense of agitated mission. Jonas Mekas, with his ever-present camera and secret smile, shot the obscure corners of life surrounding the Chelsea. I stood there holding a stuffed black crow I had bought for next to nothing from the Museum of the American Indian. I think they wanted to get rid of it. I had decided to name it Raymond after Raymond Roussel who wrote Locus Solus. I was thinking what a magical portal this lobby was when the heavy glass door opened as if swept by wind and a familiar figure in a black and scarlet cape entered. It was Salvador Dali. He looked around the lobby nervously and then, seeing my crow, smiled. He placed his elegant bony hand atop my head and said, You are like a crow, a gothic crow. Well, I said to Raymond, just another day at the Chelsea. I thought this is cool as well. Uh, Robert took the photograph for my first small collection of poems, a chapbook called Kodak published by Middle Earth Books in Philadelphia. I had in mind that it should resemble the cover of Bob Dylan on Tarantula, a cover of a cover. I bought some film and a white tab collar shirt which I wore with a black jacket and wayfarers. And as it goes, I have read Tarantula as well. Good book. So yeah, that's about all I wanted to share with you about Just Kids by Patti Smith. Obviously, I want to leave a reason for you to go out and buy it as well. But yeah, definitely a fascinating memoir, especially if you're interested in Patti Smith and just, I guess, the literary scene and yeah, what, what, what she represents as well. So would recommend. I gave it a pretty solid three point. No, I'm going to give it a four out of five because it was good and I would recommend it. So there we go. So there we have it. As always, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. And if so, no, well, I've already done that. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.